welcome back to the uh, final culminating uh, session of the first year Lord Sea Power Conference 2021 um, with a great, with a stellar panel, as you will uh, discover um, as we proceed through, uh, through the session. Um, the topic title uh, is Global Britain, Global Navy Testing the Waters. Uh, and of course, we've been hearing throughout the day um, the, the ambitions for a, uh, a global presence out there more in the world than we have seen before against the backdrop of uh, multiple other demands as well. So ambition, but calibrated ambition. Um, but we are also um, uh, interested in this session, I think, to hear how the ambition um, is viewed and is seen by others. But it also is important, I think, to understand that major navies generally are all grappling with how to weight power, presence and partnerships in the maritime domain in the continuum of competition uh, that we've been hearing about during the day. Uh, and we're about to hear from some of the key players. First, there's still only one truly global navy. Um, as opposed to a globally deployable Navy, which presents some unique challenges, but also some that are common, uh, yet at a different scale. So we've been able to um, get to the point where we can talk to um, the Chief of Naval Operations of the United States, Admiral Mike Gilday, um, Admiral, um, it's very good to, to have you aboard with us uh, today, and I'd, I'd like to immediately uh, turn it over to you to uh, give your thoughts on uh, the from, uh, from your point of view of the challenges in this uh, uh, continuum of competition that, uh, that navies and naval forces face in the maritime domain. So Admiral Gilday, please, the floor is yours. Nick, thank you. I'd also like to thank Admiral Radican uh, for having me and to the Institute and to the Royal Navy for putting together such a tremendous event. Um, it's an honor really to join all of you today, uh, in particular, to join the discussion with such a distinguished group in this panel. Um, I know that there have been that this has been a, a fantastic day of fantastic panels, and I think it's safe to say that everybody appreciates the importance of the seas to our people. Um, what I'd like to do, Nick, is to just, um, in the interest of time, so that we, uh, we dedicate as much as we can to the discussion, I just want to share a couple of thoughts in your opening comments about uh, posturing, posturing the globe, being at the right place at the right time. And um, we struggle with that in terms of posturing the globe against, uh, in our national defense strategy, five uh, problem sets. And at the top of the heap for us, of course, is China and Russia. And uh, we do struggle with being at the right place at the right time uh, with the right capabilities in the right numbers. And so some of the things that we, uh, that we lean on are the mo inherent mobility of naval forces, which is not really appreciated. Uh, it's, it's certainly it's appreciated by us, but it's not appreciated by others as much. And uh, they don't necessarily um, uh, they don't necessarily, and they, they, they see the value in naval forces, but they don't necessarily appreciate how quickly we can move from one theater to the next and how impactful that can be if it's, message, if it's messaged the right way. And I really think that CSG 21's deployment has been messaged really, really well. And I think uh, the messaging in combination with exercises and port visits, I predict is going to be pretty powerful. Um, in, a, in, a, in an era of, uh, of uh, limited resources that we all face, I think we have to carefully choose when we're gonna be out there uh, in a particular place and when we're not. And uh, what we're trying to do uh, in some cases is to look ahead to strategic events, which might be re reoccurring, let's say in the Western Pacific with an exercise from a competitor that we know is gonna happen at a predictable frequency at a predictable time and so that we can join with our allies and partners to perhaps be a presence during that time frame uh, where we can we can send a message 
to an adversary uh, or to, to a, let me say, a competitor. Um, and so I, I just open up with that, uh, Nick, to just kind of set the table with a few thoughts uh, because we can't be everywhere at once. And persistent presence is very, very difficult uh, to carry out um, uh, in this day and age, given the resources that we, uh, we have to deal with. Admiral, thank you very much for those um, for those initial thoughts and, uh, and thought thought for thought provoking um, um, uh, line of, of of thinking. There, um, uh, we'll proceed to look uh, at how one or two other um, uh, navies, key navies, uh, are looking at this as well. And and the next um, of our panelists um, represents the uh, the Indian Navy, Navy which inhabits one of the most critical bodies of water um, in, in the world globally uh, and engages across the spectrum of challenges and partnerships as well. So I'd like very much now to, uh, to ask for a perspective of the Indian Navy from uh, Vice Admiral Dinesh Tripathi, who is Director General Naval Operations of the Indian Navy. Admiral Tripathi. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, from here in Delhi. At the outset, uh, let me thank the first sea lord, Admiral Radigan, for inviting me to be part of this uh, esteemed panel and uh, share my thoughts with the, this eminent gathering of professionals, senior leaders, and subject matter experts. Uh, it is truly an honor. honor. Uh, as you would know, the ongoing uh, COVID pandemic has uh, majorly affected the established rules of business that govern the manner in which we engage with one another. Uh, it has been a tough last 15 months for the entire humanity, and that includes the armed forces and the navies. However, uh, as always, the navies, uh, through their flexibility and dexterity, find ways to continue functioning and discharging their responsibility. Uh, the Indian Navy too has adjusted to the new normal and has maintained operational tempo to fulfill the demands of uh, the maritime and national security. It has been our uh, objective to remain uh, caregivers instead of becoming caretakers. And uh, I'm very happy to uh, uh, report that uh, we have been majorly successful so far. We as a responsible Navy uh, also ensured our readiness to be the first responder uh, in our region by providing help and succor to the Indian Ocean region littorals and island nations. The Indian Navy's uh, operation uh, Samudra Setu 2, which is uh, currently in uh, progress to support national efforts in bringing uh, medical relief and critical supplies from uh, friendly foreign countries across the expanse of the Indian Ocean region. Having said that, the emergence of Indo-Pacific as a new geographic space, uh, bringing together the Indian and the Pacific Oceans represents the new strategic reality of the 21st century. Uh, this region is uh, likely to witness an increasing great power competition. And many of the future great global challenges uh, of the 21st century. The ongoing geopolitical interactions and engagements in the maritime realm of the Indo-Pacific have a cooperative as well as a competitive connotation. The cooperative connotation emerges from the fact that while land borders tend to divide, the seas unite. Most nations have a core interest in ensuring greater prosperity for its citizens and therefore keeping the seas for open for commerce. The region also offers several collaborative opportunities amongst nations in terms of blue economy, connectivity, trade, and resource sharing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, there is also a competitive connotation. Interstate conflicts, where problems on land spill over to sea, such as uh, Somalia and uh, Yemen, to name a few, 
are becoming more common. Similarly, the assertiveness and aggressive intent demonstrated by China in the South and East China Sea is certainly impinging upon the security in the region. We are all aware that high seas are not owned by any one country or any one state. They afford free movement to all and are therefore rightfully termed as global commons. The inclusive and open nature of the maritime domain suggests that countries that demonstrate preparedness, adroitness, and competence will do better than others. Towards that, keeping the factors of force, space, time, and information in one's favor in a specific geographic area remains critical to our Indian Navy's posture and presence in our, what we call our primary areas of interest. As some of you would know, our platforms continue to be uh, mission deployed from the Straits of uh, Malacca in the east to Babel Mandab in the west, so as to respond to any eventuality and contingency. We also aim to uh, maintain uh, full spectrum domain awareness for real time compilation of operational picture in the entire Indian Ocean region. Our concept of operations is guided by the vision of SAGAR, which is, by now everybody knows, an acronym for security and growth for all in the region. And it encapsulates not only the aspect of security, but also the constructive, cooperative, and collaborative essence of our engagement. We have assisted our friendly foreign countries by supplying platforms and enhancing their capability as required. Now, some of these include uh, technical assistance, including refits of ships, quality of uh, providing quality training, uh, conducting uh, surveillance in the exclusive economic zones of uh, some countries on their request, uh, conducting hydrographic uh, support, developing a comprehensive maritime domain awareness, as I brought out earlier, uh, through the newly established International Fusion Center, Indian Ocean Region. And uh, many of the liaison officers from uh, the countries uh, have already reported, and many more should join uh, by end of this year. And we are, and we are very grateful uh, to all those who have uh, deputed their uh, liaison officers. We have also signed the wide shipping information exchange agreements with many countries. And we have set up uh, coastal surveillance radar systems in many of our uh, neighborhood countries. Now, India's uh, quintessential belief in inclusivity and collective responses to common challenges is provided clear expression in the Indo-Pacific Oceans in Initiative or IPOI, which was uh, espoused by our Honorable Prime Minister Modi at the East Asia Summit two years back in 2019. I think the uh, CNO of the US Navy uh, hinted to that, that we all know that military planners will seldom have all the resources they need. And Indian Navy is no exception. But we are always ready and willing to share what we have for the benefit of our maritime neighborhood. For us, operating farther and outward from our shores in step with our country's national interests is a strategic imperative and necessity. The Indian Navy will continue to work towards enhancing maritime engagements that would benefit all maritime nations in the region. For that, we are constantly looking forward to working with our partners and friendly countries. In that sense, it is great to be a part of this session on Global Britain, Global Navy testing the waters. We look forward to the visit of uh, CSG 21 in the months ahead and interacting both at sea and in our harbors.
Uh, that's what uh, all I have to say. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your patient hearing. It has been an honor. Admiral, thank you, thank you very much uh, for those comments. Uh, we'll move swiftly along to our um, our, our third uh, senior international uh, naval representative here um, in this session. Um, France is another um, uh, nation with a with a globally deployable and deploying navy. Uh, so, with his insights on France's uh, approach to the, the conundrums of, uh, of the maritime domain and uh, and weighing the different uh, requirements and priorities, um, I'm, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Rear Admiral Nicolas Vaujour, Head of Navy International Relations for the French Navy. Admiral Vaujour, please, uh, your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, uh, to, to give me the the floor, uh, I am very honored to speak to such an audience on behalf of the French uh, CMM, uh, who deeply regrets not to be here at the time. Uh, so I would like to offer a few, a few quick thoughts uh, on the today's subject, which is one of the major issues facing the head of the French Navy. First, if we try to, to draw the context, uh, we have been facing increasing challenges to the established order for several decades. But disruptive actors uh, seek to get ground. They normally remain under the threshold of attribution or under the threshold of reaction in the gray zone and also below the nuclear threshold. But at the same time, they develop ambiguity as a course of action, making our decision process more complex. Russia is resurgent as a disruptive actor. China is seeking to assert itself. Regional powers are taking advantage of the weakness of international regulation to advance their pawn. The post-Cold War period is over. Great power competition has returned. We face confrontation on multiple fronts. In the global commons, of course, sea, space, cyberspace, but also in areas of state sovereignty, economic, fiscal, legal, territorial. We are facing a state sovereignty competition. Great power strategy have also changed. We have been used to playing chess and we are facing expert in the game of Go. The game board is not the same and the mindset is totally different. Where chess was based on attack defense to size opportunities, Go game is made of small step, pushing the opponent in his corner and winning without fighting. So what question are we being asked? Russia has chosen targeted technology. It is making a strong comeback in the, sub the field of submarine on missile technology. China is forcing us to look out at the size of our forces, as well as our ability to work in the multi-domain. Other competitors add areas of tension in the world and stretch our limited resources. Our challenge, therefore, is to remain credible in front of the actors who are testing us, to dissuade them from pushing their unlawful action too far, to stand firm without falling. Sorry, yeah. we seem to yeah. have lost, do, do you hear me? I can, we can hear you now, yes. Okay, sorry. So what, what kind of response should we give? The West was historically responded with technology, but today we have technology sometimes. If we have technology sometimes, we lack numbers. Alliances and partnerships can provide the extra numbers needed to take the decision. Moreover, partnerships reinforce know-how, open up support base, and make the competitors' risk calculus more complex. But these partnerships have one requirement, interoperability. This is a daily challenge, and even more so when we are engaged in a technological race. So what kind of Navy model should we adopt to meet these challenges? We need global navies, which means Navy capable of maintaining a continuous presence in key areas of operation. Navy capable of acting decisively thanks to its key capabilities or its superior technology. Navy with active partnerships and permanent overseas supply points. And Navy that it is responsive to rapidly changing crises. 
That's why Global Navy, Glo Global Britain sounds good to me. French Navy everyday challenge is to maintain a continuous presence at sea from the North Atlantic to the Gulf of Guinea, from the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean and up to the Indo-Pacific. French Navy is global, present and ready to act on every ocean around the globe. We always say that the sun never sets on the French Navy. But if we look, if we focus a little bit on the Indo-Pacific, we are present in the Indo-Pacific first and foremost because France is a nation of the Indo-Pacific and we protect uh, our territories and our EZ. And secondly, because France wants to assert its willingness to defend international law at sea, notably through the regular presence of its warship. Our posture can be described as follows. First, we seek presence over time from our overseas territories, La Réunion Island, New Caledonia, French Polynesia where we have assets able to protect and defend our interests. Second, we make demonstration of our ability to deploy key capabilities like Charles de Gaulle up to South China Sea in 2019, or more recently with the nuclear submarine MWOD and the LHD Tonnerre. So we develop partnership to increase our plug and fight capability and make demonstration like La Perouse exercise in the Gulf of Bengal or the amphibious exercise Arc 21 on the Japanese coast last week. Lastly, we affirm our commitment to maintaining an open and free Indo-Pacific through navigation in contested area. As a short conclusion, I could say that united we prevail. Partnership is one of the keystone of the answer we have to provide, but there is no union without interoperability. We will win this struggle by the strength of our collective will Thank you for your attention. I give you the floor. Admiral Vaujour, thank you for those thoughts and thank you to all our, um, our um, uh, foreign, foreign Navy representatives uh, for, their, uh, for their opening remarks. That concludes the, uh, uh, the, the, the round of remarks from, uh, from the Naval representatives and we will proceed uh, in, in a short while to, um, to question and answer. And I, will inv I invite those in the audience who um, who uh, have questions and interventions to do so in the way that we have been doing so throughout the day, either through the um, question and answer function or the raised hand function. So, um, so, um, so uh, get primed for that. Um, and I also should add that um, uh, although not making any uh, actual uh, prepared remarks in this session. We do also have the first Sea Lord on hand to, to contribute to the discussions as well. Uh, but before we, uh, before we get to this discussion point, I'd, I'd also like to bring in some, some outside observers, if you like, in the, in the, in the academic context. Uh, and first of all, um, to, give, to give his views and thoughts and reflections um, on, on, the, on the title subject of the session, Global Britain, Global Navy, Testing the Waters. Um, I'd like to turn uh, now to Professor Sir Hugh Strawn, the Ward Law Professor of International Relations at the University of St Andrews. So, Professor Strawn. Nick, thank you very much. Um, this morning, we heard uh, many of the questions which the so-called tilt to the Indo-Pacific raises. Uh, we also had some pretty cogent responses. Uh, and what I want to say, of course, builds on them. But we also began with a commemoration of Sir Henry Leach, the first sea lord uh, during the Falklands War. Um, that war cut across an ongoing debate uh, in Britain in 1982 about its defence policy, um, uh, whether it should move and how far it should move from a global role that was a legacy of empire to a focus on Europe um, and the threat from the Soviet Union. To many in 1982, including Henry Leach, uh, the timing of the Falklands War was a godsend. Uh, it was an opportunity to prove the Continentalists wrong. In practice, the war had no such effect in the short term, although of course in the long term, as the integrated review this year showed, uh, it still uh, lasts in, 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 with a commitment to the South Atlantic, uh, so showing how difficult it is to get rid of accretions to national strategies once they're in place. Um, and that's really my point. The strategy is in large part a debate about choices, especially for a power that has become used to domestic security uh, and to the projection of power overseas as an island 
uh, like Britain has. What should a country prioritise? What should it give up as an opportunity cost? What do you concentrate on so that the commitment is credible as a deterrent and effective if deterrence fails? The end of the Cold War removed that need for choice, which was present in 1982. Um, and as Steve Morehouse reminded us uh, from the carrier uh, strike group uh, this morning, um, what was set in train in 1980, 1998 with Strategic Defence Review um, led uh, through the idea of expeditionary warfare to the two carriers which are today uh, proceeding uh, to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, in 2015, um, the national security strategy uh, rebounded from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, once again to re-emphasize this idea of an expeditionary capability, a joint force uh, based around the carriers, but in that case also including a deployable division. The idea of the joint force is no longer present in the integrated review, but of course some of the thinking is evident. The integrated review of 2021 to its critics um, is strategically uh, uh, um, weak because uh, it continues in much the same vein. It adds in fresh commitments, uh, which have arisen recently, but it does not take any of the others away. If you talk about a tilt to the Indo-Pacific, that implies a tilt away from somewhere else, in this case, the Euro-Atlantic. Just as the US pivot to the Pacific in 2012 caused a panic in Europe because it applied, implied a, a pivot away from the Atlantic. But the integrated review itself denies there is such a tilt from the Euro-Atlantic. In fact, it insists, despite the fact that the carrier strike group is currently on its way to the Indo-Pacific, that the carrier strike group is permanently assigned to NATO. That's the adverb it uses. Uh, the integrated review um, has also rejected the defense of the so-called rules-based international order. Uh, it argues that a defense of the status quo is no longer sufficient for the decade ahead. But as David Blagden made clear this morning, and as most of today's talks have testified, um, and as indeed the integrated review itself testifies in much of the rest of the text, uh, the rules-based order remains central uh, to thinking both about maritime power and to British strategy. So once again, we seem to be having it both ways. The integrated review has broken with recent practice in two important areas. The first is that it promises uh, a follow-on document, a separate strategy for UK national resilience. Given, and, and actually as Admiral uh, Tripathi was speaking I was, uh, uh, about COVID. Um, of course, there was resonance uh, in what I'm going to say now, but given the fact that the biggest strategic challenge facing the United Kingdom, as for all other countries in 2021, is domestic in the shape of the COVID pandemic. And given that too, there is a second uh, major challenge, which is domestic to the United Kingdom, which is the union itself and those who would challenge it. It is somewhat surprising that the integrated review did not begin with national resilience, rather than promise us a strategy that will follow on in due course. Um, and it raises one question, it seems to me of fundamental importance for this conference, which is, uh, what is the maritime contribution to national resilience? I mean, the answer is considerable, of course, both in confirming the, the sea lines of communication, just in time logistics, um, and of course, in what it does uh, for UK, the UK industrial base. The second um, big uh, departure was that unlike the 2010 and 2015 national security strategies, the integrated review specifically names two state adversaries, um, Russia and China. But it does so in very different ways, and in some ways much more differently than much of the criticism or the press attention to the integrated review has given. It describes Russia as the most direct threat to the United Kingdom. But it then goes on to describe, or and it then goes on to describe China as a systemic competitor. Whereas the Defense Command paper, which came out a week after uh, the, the Global Britain paper, uh, Global Britain, a competitive age, the, the, the policy document, 
whereas the Defense Command paper uh, names China as a specifically military competitor, the Prime Minister's introduction to the uh, Global Britain in a Competitive Age document suggests that that competition will be economic um, and sublimated uh, by a trading relationship rather more than it is military. Despite its distance from the Pacific, what I think this shows is that Britain finds itself in much the same position as those powers that are in the Pacific. At one hand, those powers want to have a trading relationship with China, and on the other hand, they want a security relationship with the United States. For those in the Pacific, that balancing act has become increasingly hard to sustain because of Chinese assertiveness in the South China Sea and, of course, the ramping up of its claim to Taiwan. The US has responded by imposing a form of deterrence uh, in the, uh, 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 on the first island chain in the Western Pacific, which relies on very rapid escalation in order to manage any crisis which could emerge uh, in very short order. We in Europe tend to forget that although the Cold War ended in Europe, it never did so in East Asia, and it is now coming back to visit us in more direct ways than we had anticipated. The tension between trade and security has already caused a rift between New Zealand and the United States, as the United States has decided to prioritize trade with China rather than militarize the Five Eyes partnership. While in going the other way, Australia has opened a gap in the ANZAC partnership. The integrated operating concept, which is the third vital document really in the integrated review, which came out in, in September 2020, uh, announced by the Chief of the Defence Staff, rests on the principles of persistent engagement and constant competition. Uh, they in turn, however, rest on a readiness to escalate if they fail to contain or preempt any adversary in grey zone warfare, sub-threshold warfare, whatever title you want to use. Uh, the integrated review has a commendable and rather refreshing appetite for risk. Previous national security strategies uh, uh, which identify risks um, did so largely in order to obviate the threats that they posed. But does the integrated review appetite for risk include a readiness to escalate over the threshold to open war if persistent engagement and continuous campaigning don't actually deal with the problem? Particularly when, of course, these uh, attributes of consistent campaigning um, and uh, persistent engagement and, 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 and continuous uh, campaigning and competition, all the words that are currently going around, are being applied, applied at a considerable distance, probably, from the United Kingdom. Uh, unless, of course, we're talking about the Baltic states or the high north areas that are no, nearer and which, of course, to which, of course, they could also apply. In sending the carrier strike group to the South China Sea, the UK is signalling its commitment to, uh, ultimately, to the idea of armed conflict there, should it be necessary. Um, armed conflict there, as well as in uh, the UK's more adjacent seas. And we've heard today not just, of course, about the Indo-Pacific and the vagueness that is in that term. Is it the Indian Ocean? Is it the Pacific? Is it the seas within the Pacific? But also, of course, about the High North, about um, the, the seas around Britain, around, uh, about the Mediterranean, uh, the Sea of Azov, the position of Ukraine. It's a pretty lengthy list uh, before we even get to the Gulf. That escalation, according to the integrated review, could include the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, it says quite specifically that the United Kingdom is ready to use nuclear weapons against other nuclear armed states. Uh, and the integrated review, as was discussed already this morning, um, signals the possibility of a potential increase in the number of warhead numbers. Today's discussion has focused more on the carrier strike group uh, as the symbol of the Indo-Pacific relationship than on SSBNs uh, as a symbol of that relationship. But it is the SSBNs that are more likely to be relevant if actually what happened was conflict above the threshold. The integrated operating concept rests on new technologies as force multipliers, as well, of course, as on allies. It is ready to forfeit mass, for qualitative advantage. We've heard a lot about that both today 
uh, and in much of the briefing around the integrative review. But that trend away from mass towards qualitative advantage only increases the potential for the salience of nuclear weapons to be renewed. Thank you very much. So Hugh, thank you for, for those thoughts. And um, I, I'm sure we'll be uh, coming back to some of the themes that you've raised there. Um, our final, our final panelist um, is Dr. Lynn Kwok, Senior Fellow for Asia Pacific Security with the IISS. And I'm, I will invite her now to um, give some thoughts from, from, uh, from the region outwards, as it were, uh, as, as far as the, some of the issues raised about um, the, the, the global Navy deployment and particularly the CSG deployment is concerned as far as the UK is concerned, but more generally about the uh, the, the, the mood mu music and, and, and testing the, the temperature of the waters uh, in the region as far as the maritime domain is concerned. So, uh, Lynn, over to you. Thanks so much, Nick, and uh, congratulations to the Royal Navy and this flagship uh, conference. Um, I think the starting point uh, for discussing today's plenary session, uh, this plenary session must be that a global Britain, rather counterintuitively, can only be achieved and sustained if the UK has a clear interest, uh, a clear sense of its interests and priorities in the world. So it can't be a scatter gun approach, everything but nothing, um, because this is going to diminish its international standing and influence. Thus, we have critics of the UK's tilt to the Indo-Pacific argue that the UK has fish, fish to fry in its own neighborhood and cannot afford engagement with a region that's further afield. What's clear to me, however, is that the UK cannot afford not to be engaged in the Indo-Pacific. If the UK recognizes, as it does, that economic growth in Asia is moving the global center of gravity east, and some states are actively destabilizing the world order there, then for Britain to be truly global, it will have to more deeply engage with this economically and strategically important region. Now, the integrated review has framed UK's interests in the world um, as an interest uh, as economic security and values based. Um, I would put it slightly different, differently, having the rules-based international order and support of it as the broad overarching interest. So I would put it as the UK has a strategic interest um, in defending a rules-based order in the region, both, both as a means to promote its economic and security interests, as well as to ensure that the rules-based order is not undermined closer to home, because where rules are undermined in one part of the world, it's undermined everywhere. So I would also say that the UK has an interest in supporting its allies and partners, but I think um, that um, is, I wouldn't say secondary, but I think the main focus needs to be uh, defense of a rules-based order in support of its economic and security interests. Now, as for the mood in the region, um, it's uh, grim music, unfortunately. Um, Countries in the region are anxious, particularly given China's increasing incertainness, as well as intensifying great power rivalry, which is, of course, decreasing uh, countries' strategic choice. The maritime domain in the Indo-Pacific is seeing significant challenges. In the South China Sea, a rules-based order is under threat by China's actions fortifying disputed features and its attempts to consolidate its claims and control over the waters around them. Now, Beijing repeatedly claims that it's entitled to exercise its national sovereignty to build infrastructure and capabilities on the islands and reefs in the South China Sea. But I think this ignores the fact that um, sovereignty over such features is fiercely contested. And in, a, in the case of at least one feature that China has built on Mischief Reef, uh, a an international tribunal has found uh, that this clearly falls within the sovereignty and control of the Philippines. Um, in the waters around these features, uh, China has undermined international law in various ways. It has encroached upon the exclusive economic zone of literal states. This is in direct contravention of the 2016 tribunal ruling in the Philippines case against China. Um, China has also um, maintained a heavy presence around disputed features, including most recently around Miss, uh, Whitson Reef, which is located within 200 nautical miles of the Philippines mainland. Now, China's 
heavy presence around various disputed features is not necessarily unlawful, despite what many commentators say. This depends on the type of feature, the status of the feature, whether it's a high tide or low tide elevation, um, as well as, as its location vis-a-vis um, -vis other land features in the South China Sea. Nonetheless, the presence um, and persistence of Ch Chinese vessels around such features suggests that they are aimed at intimidation and consolidating Chinese control. Um, so that's a worrying concern, though not necessarily an, an unlawful. And third of all, China has continued to object to assertions of maritime rights and freedoms by the United States and others, including the United Kingdom. And I think all of you would remember uh, China's response to um, the HMS Albion's um, attempts to challenge China's illegal straight baselines around the parasol group of features in the South China Sea. These um, illegal straight baselines seek to uh, convert the waters within these baselines into internal waters um, within which other countries have no right of passage. Such objections on, China, such objections on China's parts, uh, part has been particularly worrying in a context of intensifying rivalry. Um, in the past, we've seen led to uh, between ships at sea. Another worrying recent development, which further raises the risk of incident and conflicts, is China's Coast Guard law, which was passed in January this year. The law permits Coast Guard to use force to defend China's jurisdictional water, a term that Beijing interprets expansively. It also empowers the Coast Guard to remove structures built by other countries on features claimed by China. So this could be quite an incendiary um, piece of le legislation, depending on how China chooses to apply it. What role then for the um, Royal Navy and the United Kingdom more broadly? I think um, great power competition as the integrated review recognizes has increased the importance of middle power contributions, including um, my view is that the United Kingdom uh, can play a modest but important role in upholding the rules-based order. As a naval power, the United Kingdom should continue to assert uh, maritime rights and freedoms um, in the South China Sea as a matter of law. This will ensure that uh, passage and high sea freedoms that, um, that are, are not lost through lack of use. As a matter of practice, it ensures that the South China Sea does not become a Chinese lake. Now, with its historical ties to the region, the UK uh, and its membership of the FPDA, the Five Eyes, um, as well as close ties to Japan, the UK is also well placed to work with allies and partners in the region uh, to build capacity. Um, an important um, area would be uh, building, uh, boosting maritime domain awareness, which I think is important as it gives coastal states greater confidence to shine light on unlawful and coercive behavior within its waters. I think countries in Southeast Asia broadly welcome a UK security presence. They also welcome the UK working with allies and partners. I would venture that you know, instead of seeing it as a weakness, they, they consider the UK leaning on allies to offer additional ships for its carrier strike group as a strength, uh, not a weakness, because anchoring different stakeholders to the region helps to take the edge off US-China competition and expands regional countries' strategic options. Now, despite signs of increased security engagement in recent years, there's still skepticism about the UK's role, unfortunately. Um, Brexit has hurt um, British credibility, uh, as well as the UK's ability to handle challenges to home. This has been questioned with COVID-19 and the ramshackle response to it, you know, Russia. And uh, of course, there's also questions of the UK's staying power where economic relations with China might be hurt. So I think that deployment of the HMS Queen Elizabeth it will be a potent symbol of power projection capability at, um, and will help uh, to boost um, the United Kingdom's credibility. But ultimately, if the United Kingdom is serious about its role in the region, it has to satisfy or its presence or engagement with the region should satisfy what I refer to as the four Ps. We often hear about uh, the persistent presence or the persistence of presence. I would add two Ps to this. Um, 
the UK presence must be principled. In other words, it must be guided by and framed as support for international law, including passage and other freedoms of the seas, the sovereign equality of states, um, the condemnation of the threat or use of force. This would help to increase the chances of support from like-minded countries in the region who might otherwise balk at a coalition that appears to be anti-China or targeted at its containment. There's been much talk about an alliance of democracies. I would urge that um, caution um, be uh, give, uh, that caution be exercised um, before framing the UK engagement with the region um, in terms of um, uh, democracies, because that might leave the United States and the UK with further partners, uh, sorry, fewer partners to work with. I think many countries in the region are not liberal democracies or even electoral democ democracies. The few democracies that there are in um, Southeast Asia are in fact backsliding. Um, as for the last P, a purposeful presence would be one that has a clear sense, and I come back to the issue of interests and priorities. A purposeful presence is one that has a clear sense of the UK's interests and priorities in the, in the Indo-Pacific. This is important not just for the UK, but also for the region, so that the region is left in little doubt about the UK's commitment. Without such an understanding, I think the UK will expect the UK to be a fair weather partner here today and gone at the first sight of trouble closer to home. Um, it's impo also important to remember, even though this is um, a, a session about um, a conference about the, uh, the UK's uh, the Royal Navy, um, it's also important to remember that for the region, it's not only about security, but economics and upholding a rules-based order in a region that is in dire need of development, in dire need of infrastructure, can only be achieved by offering the region economic options as well. So to conclude, for the UK's engagement in the Indo-Pacific to be credible, the UK cannot be seen as testing the waters as the subtitle of this panel suggests it might be doing. It's either a player with strong strategic interests in the region or it is not. It is either in or out. If the UK is going to tilt to the Indo-Pacific, it must do so assuredly, keeping the four Ps in mind, a presence that is persistent, principled and purposeful. Any wobble on the tilt will not go unnoticed in the region and the UK's credibility will be hurt. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Lynn, thank you. Thank you very much for, um, for those thoughts. Um, uh, we seem to be having a bit of uh, connection problems, which is interfering a little bit with, um, with, the, uh, with the feed and with, with the session. So I hope, I hope that isn't uh, going to be too, um, too much of a distraction. And in, in particular, um, we're now in the uh, discussion part of the uh, uh, of the session, which, uh, as with the prepared remarks, uh, uh, is on the record. Um, and uh, I encourage um, uh, those of you in the audience to, uh, to to put your put your questions and and, and, and interventions. Um, but I'd like to um, I'd, I'd like to um, uh, kick off the discussion. And in particular, I'd just like to check if uh, uh, Admiral Gilday whether you're you're still on the line because I I think we were having some problems with your. With your connection. Admiral Gilday, are you there? Don't seem to be having uh, having much luck in raising him, uh, and unfortunately. Um, I wonder if we can uh, can uh, try and re-establish uh, the connection. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, in terms of proceeding with the discussion um, what, what I would what I would like to um, what I would like to, to, to do is to explore this question of, uh, of partnerships a, 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 a bit further uh, and, and, in, and in particular um, uh, look at uh, partnerships in the, in, in the context of trying to balance presence and and, 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 and the credibility of capability in, particularly in terms of in terms of deployment and, and perhaps if if Admiral Vaujour you're um, you're on the line you could um, you could give us some more thoughts uh, from your perspective on um, the the issue of trying trying to balance presence and and and, and, and the credibility Credibility of capability. How do you how do you assess that in terms in terms of providing um, the, a deterrent effect in, in, in the way that you um, in, in the way that you uh, 
uh, operate and posture and, and deploy forces. Admiral Vaujour. Thank you, Nick. It's a great question. Uh, trying to be to balance uh, between um, deterrence and uh, conventional deterrence, I, I have to say, and uh, be able to, to gather together uh, partners uh, around you uh, is, uh, first of all, um, a political issue that you you would like you need to um, to align the political views of the two countries of the three countries or the messaging you would like to push uh, inside your deployment or something like, something like that. When you are going when you make a transit through the Spratly Island, for example, if you are alone, it's only a bilateral view uh, with uh, China, and so you address a message to China. If you do it with a partner, it is not the same not the same message. So you have to, to deal with what kind of message you would like to address to your competitors, what kind of message, and it is a political message, definitely. And so it's quite difficult to find the good uh, line of communication, uh, the good uh, message you would like, to, uh, you would like to, to, to address. And as you say, balance, your, your balance position in that part of the world is also that China definitely is one of the biggest economic power in the world. And so that uh, you cannot fight directly with China if you do not want to have any consequences in, the, in another part of your uh, uh, dialogue with, uh, with that country. So that's why I speak about uh, competition of sovereignty because it is not only global comments where we have to, to be balanced, it's also in the economic, uh, Field in the lawfare, in the in the legal, in the territorial dispute, and, and so on. So, um, our balance uh, posture uh, in um, in Indo-Pacific is quite uh, difficult to to achieve. Uh, when we the the, the right the right uh, exact words, um, our posture is consistent, predictable, and non-provocative. That's the term, the exact term for the French Navy. Consistent, predictable, non-provocative. But we are firm to affirm that we need to uh, have an open and free Indo-Pacific. So that's always very difficult to have that kind of balanced posture. And uh, it's always a challenge. And when we are doing that with partners, we have to align our uh, way of communicate to the competitors. I don't know if I respond to your question, Nick. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you. Um, Admiral Tripathi, how, how would you see um, that the, the partnerships in, 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 in detail, uh, particularly in I, I guess in the Indian Ocean, how would you see the naval partnerships evolve? What do you what, what do you think we will see uh, in terms of, of activities and, uh, and and exercising and cooperation going forward? Uh, and uh, since the seas are interconnected, actually all of us who are sitting here, uh, all of us are uh, maritime neighbors. And uh, whilst uh, our uh, ships are deployed, not only ships, our units are deployed uh, for uh, ensuring that our uh, national interests are uh, taken care of, we also uh, uh, support uh, the Indian Ocean uh, littorals, and island countries uh, in, uh, I would say, uh, all four roles, classical roles of a Navy. Uh, fortunately, till now, we, we don't have to, or we didn't have to employ the military role, but uh, the other three roles, uh, we are always there, uh, whether there is a flood, there is a uh, cyclone, uh, there's a requirement for providing uh, any kind of assistance uh, uh, some grounding happening somewhere. Uh, the Indian naval ships have been there in, uh, in this part of the world. Uh, as if I take you back to 2004, uh, uh, the great tsunami, December 2004, uh, that is the time when Indian uh, naval ships immediately uh, went out and supported uh, our partner countries from uh, Indonesia to Sri Lanka to Maldives, whilst we had problems in our own country. 
And since then, uh, there have been a number of instances where we have demonstrated uh, and uh, we have tried to become the preferred uh, security partner, preferred uh, partner for all our, uh, our countries by enhancing trust. As all of you would know, uh, the forces and the force numbers can be searched, but uh, the trust is built over many years uh, and it cannot be searched immediately when required. And that is what we are trying to do. We are trying to be a force for good in this area. We are trying to use whatever capabilities which we have got for the larger good to ensure that the maritime security uh, is looked after, the global commons are safe for trade for all, all countries, uh, including ours. And uh, we are trying to uh, uh, ensure that we engage in partnerships with as many countries as possible uh, in terms of uh, carrying out uh, multilateral, bilateral exercises, coordinated patrols, uh, carrying out uh, surveillance in uh, EEZ of various countries, port visits, of course, and we request many, all of you, all navies to visit our ports, uh, uh, providing uh, material and uh, subject matter expert uh, support so uh, it is it is a full package which uh, which we are doing within our capabilities but uh, no navy probably can do everything and i think uh, the cno was very right in his opening remarks that it is persistent presence in uh, all areas it's just not possible and we have got only those many ships and that's why we are looking at uh, partnerships uh, both uh, for sharing white shipping as also gray shipping and uh, vessels of interest information uh, I think we have we are moving forward. Uh, these are these are very interesting times, you know. Uh, uh, I'm sure all of you will agree. Maybe uh, once in a century time. I'm not talking of pandemic. Pandemic, of course, is one century. But you know, at this point of time, the, uh, the it's the many things are in a state of flux or a development. You take it from geopolitics to geo strategy to technologies which are coming in to the warfare tactics which are being employed by the state and non-state actors. And uh, I would say the, the next five, 10 years are going to be defining uh, moment in, the, in this in the, for the 21st century as to where, where we go. And so therefore these are interesting times, very difficult to crystal gauge where we go. But uh, to, be, to, to conclude, I would say that uh, the Indian Navy is all for uh, cooperation, uh, collaboration, and uh, working uh, uh, with our partners in all fields. Admiral Tripathi, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to try one more time uh, to see if we can uh, retrieve uh, the CNO. Um, is, uh, is the CNO on the, on the line? That, uh, that uh, sounds quite, quite deafening uh, for the time being. Um, 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 um. No, it's muted. It's muted. Uh, Nick, can you hear me? Uh, Admiral, Admiral Gilday, is that, is that you? It's me. It's me. Excellent. Uh, that's, uh, that's, 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 that's very good. I'm, so, I'm sorry we, we lost you for, for a period, but it's great, it's great to have you back on board, as it were, um, and we were, we were in, in, in the process of, um, of, of discussions and uh, you, 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 you posed some thoughts at the beginning and we haven't had a chance to re return to them, but I'd, I'd like to, um, to, to ask you, uh, if, if I may, on the question of, um, of, of, of partnerships that, 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 we're, that we're looking at now and, and you've, you, you've clearly underri underwritten the, um, the uh, current carrier deployment in, in terms of uh, the uh, cooperation and integration of, of US forces into, into this deployment and in, and in general in the regeneration of, of the UK's carrier capability. Um, no doubt because to a large extent it is of mutual benefit to, to both of you strategically. And I'd just like perhaps if you could elaborate a bit more on the value of that and, and, and where, where that level of capability uh, sits in terms of, of, of what you value as, as far as allies and partners. Your, your new US maritime 
strategy uh, emphasizes the, the, the need and the and the asymmetric advantage that you have in terms of in terms of partners and partnerships. But but what sort of capabilities do you really value uh, from the U.S. Navy perspective as you face the challenges that you face? Thanks, Nick. Um, and I have been able to follow um, most of the discussions uh, this afternoon. Uh, past um, Over the past five months, since the 1st of January, I took a look at the number of uh, exercises that the U.S. Navy has participated in with allies and partners, and it's nearly 40. And that's indicative of how much we value those partnerships and that, and that teamwork. And every single one of those partners brings a, brings a capability to bear that we need to be able to uh, flex and to, and, to, and to leverage as much as we can, just as they need to leverage the capabilities that we bring to bear. Um, with uh, uh, Admiral, Admiral uh, Radican really is the first uh, person that I, I'm aware of that really, really uh, leveraged or, or coined the word uh, um, interchangeability with respect to how our navies operate together. And I'm really keen on that concept. Um, I think if you take a look at how our navies rely on each other uh, in the Arabian Gulf, as an example, where a U.S. ship or a Royal Navy ship can interchangeably, as an example, um, escort our ships through the uh, Bab Bab Mandeb or, or through the Strait of Hormuz is powerful. Uh, and we do it with just a blink of an eye. With the French in the past month, they have actually served as uh, CTF-50 in the Arabian Gulf with uh, the, USS, uh, Dwight D, the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower strike group falling underneath them uh, in a C2 structure. So I think that kind of interchangeability, almost like a Swiss army knife, is really a, a good way to think about, uh, we shouldn't self-limit, I guess, in other words, Nick, in terms, in terms of how we leverage each other's capability. Uh, whoever the partner is. If I could go back to the, 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 uh, the conversation that was just ongoing and, and perhaps add a fourth P uh, uh, to, to persistence, principled, and then purposeful, I would also add um, uh, predictability. And I, I, think that, um, I think that it might be useful, particularly when resources are constrained and we can't be everywhere all the time, to think about being um, strategically predictable, which I think gets at the original three Ps. Uh, and perhaps we could be operationally, more operationally unpredictable. And so that's when we perhaps look for strategic opportunities that we can leverage with allies and partners. We can set expectations with them in terms of when we're gonna be working with them and when we're not. Uh, and then we can look for those opportunities when at the right time and the right place and, and importantly, uh, with the right uh, tone and substance of messaging, we can make big impact. And we can measure that, whether it's our allies and partners in their open press, or if it's with our competitors uh, through intelligence channels, uh, and we can get a sense of how effective we are um, uh, with that operational unpredictability. Uh, and I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll pause there, Nick. Admiral Gilday, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to turn to a, a question uh, from from the audience, from uh, Craig Hilson of the Royal Navy, and it goes back to this uh, the, 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 the question of responses, regional responses, I suppose. Um, uh, and he's, he asks, with such high-profile activities being planned with multiple world-class navies in the Indo-Pacific region, has there been a tension? Uh, a great deal of attention uh, gained from countries in the region. Uh, and and uh, how do you anticipate adverse reactions and how to be, how to be prepared for the potential for adverse reactions? Um, uh, Admiral Gilday, perhaps I, I don't know if you want to pick up on that one as well. Sure, I think our messaging uh, has to be crystal clear in terms of when we're operating together, what we what we intend to do, uh, not only through our words but also our actions, and so I think that we and, and the chance of miscalculation, which could be which could be catastrophic, uh, and so I, I think that um, certainly, uh, and I'll give an example: the uh, Harry S. Truman Strike Group uh, in late in 2018 
made a surprise trip to the high north, operated with, uh, operated with the Royal Navy, and we hadn't done that in a generation. We, through uh, analysis afterwards, we, we did surprise uh, the Russians, but in our maneuvers, we tried to be very careful about not being too provocative uh, uh, with respect to uh, setting any kind of tone that we were that we were trying to be adversarial in any way. And so uh, it really all it, it consistently it's been about uh, free and open maritime commons. I'll, I'll pause there. Admiral Admiral Vaujour, uh, do you have any do you have any thoughts on that um, that question of um, anticipating adverse reaction and, uh, and, uh, and 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 how to respond to that? Uh, yes, thank you, thank you, Nick. Uh, anticipating the reaction of the adversary is quite uh, always difficult. So the the, the way you can uh, uh, try to anticipate is firstly to be uh, to have a persistent presence in that kind of area. I, I mean. Uh, when we are speaking about uh, China, we try to, to go through the Spratlys uh, twice or three times a year. And we try to evaluate the different reaction year after year and to see if there is uh, an evolution of the posture of uh, our competitors. And uh, I think that the, it's very important to share between partners lessons learned of the different interaction we could, we could have uh, on the same competitors. I mean that we share with the US, of course, with the Brits, with the Australians, with India, uh, what, we, uh, what we meet, what we have uh, of kind of interaction with, uh, with China. And we see that during four years now, there, are every, there, there is some change in the posture of China. And one of the main is the maritime law uh, for the Coast Guard, for example. Uh, but uh, we saw that every day, day after day, we can show that uh, they are changing their posture. And uh, so that's very important to test them, not to be provocative, but to verify that they are changing or not the posture. And for sure, to share that, uh, that kind of information between partners and allies in order to have the best analysis of uh, China uh, posture and compartment in that kind of uh, area. So. Uh, to know uh, your competitors, you have to face him sometimes uh, very closely. And uh, so you have to be there. If you stay in France, you will not have any confrontation with uh, China. So you have to come there to be in Indo-Pacific, to test them and to verify that their line of operation change or not uh, in that part of the world. And for sure, uh, to, uh, to share that kind of information with your partner. Thank you. Um, we have a question. Uh, here in the room from uh, Erica Pepe from the uh, Institute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. So throughout the day, we discussed the crucial role of the Royal Navy as allies in ensuring the field of, of navigation and open seas. And we also, we also mentioned the China's Maritime Silk Road and China's effort to create a network of key ports in various coastal countries. And we discussed the fact that the maritime crucial checkpoint the choke points might potentially pose a threat to the ability to deploy effectively where it is needed, even when access to port is not required for the continuity of operations. So how does the Royal Navy and also its allies, um, which are present here today, intend to address the increasing uh, geopolitical risks, specifically coming from adversarial control of uh, world maritime choke points, um, such as the Strait of Malacca? Thank you. So, um, uh, concerned at, at the strategic level about you know potential effects on on, on the maritime choke points, um, uh, Admiral Admiral Gilday. I, I missed the I missed the question. Could you repeat it? Having a bit of communications problems again. Yeah. Um, Admiral Gilday, can you hear me? Uh, no, okay, we've. Um, uh, I'm not sure if we'll be able to re retrieve the, the Admiral again, but, but perhaps um, um, Admiral Tripathi um, and, and Admiral Vaujour, perhaps I could ask you if, uh, if you could respond to Erica's question about concerns 
um, uh, about uh, you know potential effects for um, uh, maritime choke points of uh, you know, adversarial influence and in, in maritime checkpoints. Admiral Vaujour, perhaps. Sorry, I think that Admiral Kripati was would like to speak now. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I well, don't know. Me... I, I cannot say also, but uh, Admiral Tripathi. Well, let, yeah, I, I can I can give uh, my viewpoint. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So uh, maritime maritime uh, maritime choke points and the control uh, is not new, as all of us are aware. And uh, the uh, India and Indian Ocean region is uh, actually beset with a number of uh, these choke points, and we are aware of uh, uh, their vulnerabilities. Whether it is uh, Strait of Hormuz, whether it is uh, the Red Sea and uh, Suez Canal, or uh, going towards the west, a number of uh, choke points which are there. And uh, most of uh, our trade, and uh, I would say most uh, large quantity of world's trade, passes through those, these choke points, including China's. And I'm sure uh, every country has, uh, has an interest in ensuring that these choke points are uh, are uh, uh, re remained open and they are not uh, used inimically by any any one country, uh, and uh, India is no different. So we we certainly uh, that's why I said we have got our uh, uh, ships mission deployed, mission based deployed, uh, whether it is in uh, the Gulf of uh, Oman to safeguard our uh, ships coming out from the Arabian Gulf or uh, in the uh, Babel Mandav area, the ships coming out from there. We have also got uh, ships uh, in uh, uh, Malacca Straits because uh, a large volume of our trade comes from there. And I have no doubt that uh, most countries uh, will be doing that. It will remain a challenge, uh, no doubt, uh, in, term, in the times of uh, tension building up and the hostilities uh, becoming imminent or uh, hostilities have broken out uh, or some kinetic action has been taken. Certainly the uh, choke points uh, uh, will come into play majorly. And uh, I have no doubt that uh, all of us uh, who, are, who have been planners uh, or planners would have taken into this, uh, into our uh, uh, planning and uh, formulated uh, plan B as to what is to be done to safeguard own trade. And at the same time, uh, how to, uh, uh, you know, make uh, this vulnerability uh, very, very acute to the adversary. Thank you. Ad Admiral Vaujour, did you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Short point is very specific place uh, for uh, a navy, uh, of course, uh, because it's a place where um, state actors can act in the gray zone. I mean that uh, they can act uh, without being detected, and so it's a great challenge for uh, our our navy for protecting the the, the, the commerce and the, the merchant shipping. And uh, what we try to achieve. Uh, especially Gulf of Hormuz, for example, uh, it to increase the cost of the action of our adversary. I mean that if you are there, if you are uh, visible uh, on the, in the straits, uh, they, they, they need to increase the cost. I mean that uh, if, you, if you can name and shame who is doing the bad action, uh, it is uh, very hard for the, uh, for the adversary and so um, I think that uh, at, at that time, it, it is one of the way we are, we are acting, be present, uh, increase the cost for the adversary. And so it's a way to provide a, a military effect. But at the same time, you, you need to protect yourself against terrorist action or something like that, which, is, which are not state actors. And it is more in Babel Mondeb Strait, for example, uh, with uh, USV, USV uh, with a uh, big uh, military church. And so uh, you have to, uh, to be protected for your forces and to try to uh, detect uh, state actors uh, outside of the gray zone. And so that, that's my thought at the time. Thank you, Admiral Vaujour. Um, I will 
make one last um, hail for um, Admiral Admiral Gilday. See if he is on. See if he's on the line. And we're out of time, but it was it would be very good if he if he were if he were there just to um, to, to be present as we as we draw things to a close. Admiral Gilday. Nick, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Uh, Good. Nick, uh, those were two really thoughtful, um, thoughtful answers. I, I think that uh, straits and choke points are another area, particularly after what's happened in the Suez recently. <laughs> well, I think that was a fairly succinct and, uh, and, and rounded response. Um, uh, uh, which, um, which, 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 which actually nicely encapsulated, I think, the the concern um, on the basis that uh, that uh, Admiral Gilday has, uh, has 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 dropped the connection again. Um, all I was really going to say was, unfortunately, um, we are really out of time. Uh, also, unfortunately, our our, um, our comms links have let us down slightly in this in this final session. Having said that, it's been really great um, having um, the engagement, uh, not only of. Uh, Sir Hugh Strawn, but also um, our colleague Lynn Quatt, but most particularly um, the perspectives of um, three key navies and 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 very senior and key personnel from those na navies, not least um, Admiral Gilday, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Vaujour from France, and um, Admiral Tripathi from the Indian Navy. So I thank all of you for your um, for your contributions and for your responses. Uh, to um, to questions, um, but I I fear we now have to draw those conclusions uh, th th this session to a conclusion. Um, so so thank you all. Um, as I mentioned, we have um, first Sea Lord on hand here, and um, I would now like to invite him uh, to um, bring the overall proceedings to a close by offering perhaps some concluding remarks on on. Uh, on the events of, of the day and the discussions and, and, and the, um, the conclusions that he is forming as a result of those discussions. So, Ad Admiral, over to you. And uh, Nick, uh, thanks very much. I, I, I'm going to try and avoid uh, summarising the day, uh, if you don't mind. Um, but I would just like to sort of offer, firstly, my thanks. Thank you to you. I think it's third time lucky uh, in terms of in terms of hosting this conference uh, and we finally pulled it off um, but thank you very much for the facilitation and for double i double s uh, for enabling this conference i'd also like to thank um, the help that we've had from our industry sponsors which again is very significant i'd particularly like to thank our international friends for joining us this conversation would not be as rich without those inputs in fact it would be it would almost be delinquent if we were doing this without uh, that help. So thank you very much. And I'd like to shout, give a shout out to uh, an, an event that we held uh, during the middle of the conference, which was to reach out to some young uh, maritime strategists, which was uh, fascinating because it reached down to um, the most junior levels in the Royal Navy, our most junior sailors uh, and Marines, uh, involved some of industry, some of our reservists, um, but was but was but was useful to have about thirty of them and their perspective uh, and the opportunity for them to ask their questions specifically. Um, in terms of the, the, the sort of how it feels at the end of the day, I I think there's a sort of balance between some positives and some challenges. So I think um, regardless of differing views about the UK's integrated review and and where it might have been tighter or better or sharper or whatever. I think for those of us in defence, we absolutely welcome that we have the clarity of a government that is investing in UK defence, a foreign policy that has matured, and then a defence command paper, as well as an industrial strategy that lays out some direction for us to follow. And then I also think that that is juxtaposed against some very serious challenges, whether that's how we respond to a technological revolution, whether we respond to some bigger issues, such as the domestic ones uh, and the pandemic, or the enormous global challenge of climate change, as well as this very searing issue of state on state and the prospect of state on state conflict and, and the geopolitics that follow that. And I think 
conferences like today um, reassert that in order to try and balance those positives against those challenges, that we will have to reach out to our international friends, we have to reach out beyond the Ministry of Defence in particular, we have to reach out to industry, to academia, and to get a richness of views to help us with those, with those challenges and that balancing act. And, and that, to me, is the importance of, of, of our going forwards, that we look to, to address the direction we've been given and do it in the context that we face and a number of challenges that we're trying to uh, square up against in order to, to deliver as best as possible, both for our nation and to our partner nations. So um, I'm very, very grateful for the conference. Um, it's been an enjoyable day. Uh, I also like the richness that we get by having a hybrid conference with having people in the room and being able to reach out to a wider audience. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Nick, and, uh, and over to you. Admiral, thank, thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to um, offer my thanks to everyone who has taken part in, in, in today's events, both um, the, um, the active participants, the speakers in, 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 the, in the various panels. As, as you said, Admiral, it's been a, a, a really rich um, uh, day of discussion uh, across a broad spectrum of, um, of, of, of issues. Um, I'd also like to thank all of those who have um, been attending uh, the, the, the sessions throughout the day and for the uh, the interventions that, uh, that they have made so uh, I very much appreciate that and on behalf of um, uh, Dr John Chipman the Director General and Chief Executive of the IISS I'd like to thank the, the Naval staff and, uh, and, and in you first Sea Lord uh, for, um, for uh, engagement uh, with us in, in, this, in this event uh, and uh, with that um, I'd like to bring proceedings finally to a close so thank you very much.